this uh, background here is supposed to uh, symbolize you know, the search for, uh, for new physics. And uh, of course, as you all know, uh, one of the uh, most important you know, recent steps in that direction uh, was taken with the discovery of the uh, Higgs boson. It's already over five years ago, almost uh, six years ago now. Uh, so this is actually a picture of uh, Peter Higgs when he was working out some of the details of his theory uh, back in 1965. So uh, if the screen was good enough, you could actually perhaps make out some of his uh, secrets. <laughs> so of course now what we're all wondering, and that's the title of the colloquium, is uh, is there any other you know, bump on the horizon that we're going to be discovering within our lifetimes, or at least your lifetimes, if, if not my lifetime. So, that's what we're trying to do. Now, when I'm trying to explain this to a, a general public, then uh, I often use as my uh, talking point uh, this famous painting by uh, Paul Gauguin. So you remember that uh, in this picture, uh, these people are asking themselves some very basic questions about uh, us and our place in the universe. What are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? And uh, I actually had a copy of this picture in my office when I was a PhD student uh, just to remind myself why I came into work every day. Because my point of view is that the job of us particle physicists, and specifically CERN and the LHC, is precisely to at least study these questions. Maybe we don't find the answers, but you know, the quest in itself is, uh, is valuable and, and important. So uh, that was why I came into the office as a PhD student a, a long time ago, but in the same galaxy. And <laughs> that's still why I come into the office. <coughs> okay, so now when I'm uh, talking about Gauguin's questions, of course, I think those people were posing the question in a somewhat more metaphysical sense than we physicists do. And uh, when I try to translate those questions into the language of physics, uh, what are we becomes what is matter made of, and of course a key aspect of that question is, is why do things weigh? If, for example, if the electron did not have a mass, there would be no atoms, and there wouldn't be any us, uh, let alone Donald Trump. So, I could also ask, you know, what is the origin of Donald Trump? Or perhaps more generally, <laughs> what is the origin of the matter in the universe? Uh, and a particularly pertinent question nowadays is what is the dark matter that fills the universe? Uh, or at least the White House. <laughs> uh, where do we come from? Where are we going? So those questions for us physicists become how does the universe evolve and why is the universe so big and so old today? <coughs> and of course, we would also like to know what is the future of the universe just in case there is any future to the universe after Donald Trump. <laughs> okay, so as I said, our job as particle physicists is to ask these questions, and every once in a while we find an answer, like uh, 2012 we discovered the Higgs boson, and now I'm going to talk in, in this presentation about some of the other questions we have about how we might hope to find the answers. So, much of what I'm going to say concerns uh, physics at the LHC. Uh, experiments at the LHC are in fact addressing many of these questions. I'm not necessarily going to address all those questions in this talk, but a significant fraction of them I will. Okay, so uh, for the benefit of uh, the new students in the audience, let me just first of all remind you of the uh, content of the standard model. So you Got the quarks, six quarks over here on the left. Uh, on the right, you've got the electron with a couple of heavier electron like particles, and uh, in between, you've got the neutrinos. So, so I know that here in Valencia, neutrinos are a very big local interest. I'm afraid that in this talk, I'm not going to have enough time to do justice to the physics of neutrinos. <coughs> anyway, those are the matter particles, and uh, we distinguish four fundamental forces acting upon them. So uh, there's uh, gravity, which of course has been very much in the news in the last year or two. Uh, electromagnetism, uh, unified by James Clark Maxwell when he was a professor at King's College London just over 150 years ago. And then we've got the uh, strong and the weak nuclear interactions. 
all of them carry high particles, and the weak nuclear interaction is, of course, weak because the particle that carries it, the top of boson, is very heavy, it weighs as much as the medium sized nucleus. So, so, again, for a general audience, I sort of refer to these things as being uh, the cosmic DNA, which uh, somehow encode all the information needed to make uh, the, all the visible, visible stuff in the universe. Except, of course, that's not quite true, because what you have on this slide does not explain where particle masses come from. Uh, as I already said, if the electron didn't have a mass, there wouldn't be any atoms. If this particle here didn't have a mass, the weak interactions would not be weak, the universe would be completely different, life as we know it would be completely impossible. So, it was very important to figure out where particle masses originate. So, uh, a proposal was made in 1964 uh, by Angler and Braut, and also by Peter Higgs in a couple of papers that he wrote independently of Angler and Braut. And uh, those papers were followed up by uh, another one by Gravalnik, Hagen, and Kibble. And uh, these are the people who, in 1964, set out the basic mechanism for generating particle masses in the standard model. Now, I'd like to also give a shout out to these two guys. These are Migdal and Polyakov, who, as 19-year-old students in the then Soviet Union, invented all this stuff completely independently. So if you look at the publication date of their paper, it's a bit later. That's because the Soviet academicians would not allow them to publish the paper. They couldn't believe that two 19-year-old students could make such a big breakthrough. So I tell you this story because if there are any 19-year-old students in the audience, hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you will provide the answer to the other questions that we're going to be asked. Okay, so uh, these people all proposed a, a mechanism for uh, generating particle masses, uh, which was then subsequently, in 1967-1968, incorporated into the standard model. So, uh, for the somewhat older students, uh, here I remind you of the particle content of the standard models. So we've got the leptons up here, we've got the quarks down here, and uh, here is uh, the Lagrangian, which, uh, as is well known, you can write on the t-shirt, uh, but not today. Okay, so uh, I divided the Lagrangian up into uh, four lines. The top line describes gauge interactions, the fundamental forces, uh, electromagnetism, etc. The second line, how those forces act on the particles of matter, you know, think photoelectric effect, and so on. And then the two bottom lines, those are the ones that involve what we often call the Higgs field, although I think it should be called the Angler Brout Higgs field. Uh, so here, the Higgs field phi is giving masses to the fundamental <coughs> fermions, and here, this is actually the term where the W boson gets its mass. So it's worth reminding ourselves that these two bottom lines here, there's absolutely no direct experimental evidence uh, before the discovery of the Higgs boson back in 2012. There have been plenty of confirmation of the two top lines of this Lagrangian, but the two bottom lines were terra incognita until 2012. So what I'm going to be doing in a significant part of this talk is discussing what we now know about those two bottom lines and what indications they may or may not provide now or in the future about possible physics beyond the standard model. Okay, so uh, in that Lagrangian, uh, so the third line, that was the one that gave masses to the fundamental matter particles. So that gives you, for example, the decay of the Higgs boson into pairs of fermions, uh, which was, to my knowledge, first pointed out by Weinberg in 1967. And the bottom line in the, the Lagrangian on the previous page gave you the coupling of the Higgs to vector bosons which was actually discussed in quite some detail by Peter Higgs in the paper that he wrote in 1966, the one that he was working on when I showed you that picture on the first slide. Okay, so actually nobody paid very much attention to uh, those papers by Higgs, Grashel, Salam, etc. 
uh, in, until about 1970-1972, when Tolft and Veltman showed that you could calculate with a, with a standard model. That it was a normalizable field theory, and you could use it to make precise predictions. But still, nobody paid very much attention to the Higgs boson. Uh, but in 1975, together with Mary Gayar and Dmitry Anopoulos, we decided it was about time that people started thinking about what the Higgs boson might actually look like in an experiment. But at that time, so these ideas were still regarded as being uh, pretty speculative, and uh, the distinguished professors in the first row uh, were somewhat critical of all these novel gauge theory ideas, and that's one of the reasons why we wrote at the end of our paper that we do not want to encourage big experimental searches for the Higgs boson. Fortunately, our experimental colleagues did not take that advice. <laughs> so probably you shouldn't take any advice I give you in the rest of this talk either. <laughs> So that was 1975. Come 1984, there was the uh, first uh, experimental conference, conference about experimentally what you would do with the LHC. And uh, I got the job of discussing uh, researches for new particles that you could do with the LHC, uh, together with Graciela Gelmini and Lee Kowalski. And uh, of course, looking for the Higgs boson uh, took a pride in place. And here are a couple of plots from our paper. Uh, so, aficionados of the LHC will recognize the muon fusion and W boson fusion, two of the main processes for producing the Higgs boson of the LHC, as we'll be discussing in a moment. Okay, so uh, time moved on, and now we've got very precise calculations for uh, the production of the Higgs boson at the LHC, coming for the uh, Higgs cross section working group. And uh, this is a plot showing you, as a function of the Higgs mass, what the cross-section should be. So the dominant contribution comes from gluon fusion, as I mentioned. Uh, there's a W fusion down here somewhere, yeah, that's the red one. And uh, production in association with a vector boson, and so on. So of course, we now know the Higgs mass is about 125 GeV. And it just so happens that for 125 GeV, all these mechanisms could be observed at the LHC, and many of them have been already. Uh, if the Higgs boson had happened to weigh, just pick a number, 750 GeV, uh, then it would have been very difficult to uh, produce it, and we couldn't have dis discovered very much about it. But we were lucky. So, the LHC experiments have uh, done a fantastic job in uh, measuring many, many processes. Uh, so here we have uh, what's often called the stairway to heaven plot, showing uh, production of jets, W bosons, like losers plus jets. And here I highlight processes involving the production of the Higgs boson. So Higgs boson has not only been uh, well and truly discovered, but also we've been able to figure out many of its properties and look among those properties for possible clues as to what physics might lie beyond the standard model. So this is a, uh, a picture from uh, the day when the discovery of a new particle was announced on July the 4th, 2012. And uh, here you see a bunch of uh, distinguished former director, director general of CERN, uh, acknowledging the cheers of the crowd. Uh, I pay particular attention here to Lynn Evans, who uh, of course was the guy who actually built the LHC. And uh, this is another picture taken on the same day, uh, which I like for two reasons. One reason is because here you see Bossa André and Peter Higgins. It's so a little story that they had written their papers in, in 1964 this was 2012, but in the intervening 48 years, they had never met. This is the instant when they met. Of course, the following year, they met again in Stockholm. <laughs> so, so that's one reason why I like this picture. The other reason why I like this picture is because, oh, I'm not sure how she got there. That's supposed to be Fabiola Giannotti, who, uh, <laughs> small mistake, who uh, announced the discovery of the Higgs boson, of the, the boson on behalf 
of the Atlas collaboration, of course, is now Twenty Ten Water. So. Okay, so what we know about the Higgs and what does this tell us about possible new physics beyond the standard model? Well, one thing we know is the mass. And uh, the mass has now been measured quite accurately. These are the results, combined results of Atlas and CMS from the first round of the LHC. Uh, and uh, these are preliminary results from round two of the LHC. And uh, as you can see, they all cluster around 125 GV. And if you just combine them in a very naive way, ignoring shared systematics and so on, you come up with uh, what's almost now at the level of a one per mil determination of the mass of the Higgs boson. So what, you might ask? What, what, what's the interest in knowing very accurately the mass of the Higgs boson? Well, one reason is because then we can do very precise tests of the standard model by, for example, looking at the production and decay rates of the Higgs, which of course are predicted in the standard model. The other reason, which is highlighted here, is the stability of the electroweak vacuum. And this is a topic I want to discuss next. So, probably most of you, if not all of you, know that in the standard model, uh, you have spontaneous symmetry breaking due to an effective potential which looks like this. Right? It looks like a Mexican hat, or if you prefer, which probably you do here at the bottom of a wine bottle. <laughs> now, that side of the Mexican hat goes up. And it goes up because of the self-coupling of the Higgs, which is this quantity lambda here. Now that lambda, that's a coupling, like any other coupling in a normalizable field theory. It varies as a function of the scale. And in fact, it renormalizes itself, and that's illustrated here. So if you look at that, you see that what that actually tends to do, that self-normalization, tends to increase the value of lambda as you go to larger scales. So it makes the bottle size get even steeper. But in the standard model, that's not the dominant contribution to renormalization. The dominant contribution actually comes from loops of top quarks. So this is the, the leading effect shown here. That's a negative renormalization. So it actually tends to turn down the size of the Mexican hat. So if you imagine the Mexican hat no longer has a brim, but the brim is turned down. And uh, you can estimate at what scale that happens. And if you put in the measured value of the Higgs that I just mentioned, and the measured value of the top quark, you find that this instability <coughs> sets in somewhere around 10 to the 11 GB. This uncertainty here is probably understated, but it certainly looks like there is some issue with the Higgs self coupling that are negative at some scale. Now, I, I personally believe that you know, that instability is not real. I think there's surely new physics which prevents this instability from occurring. And one possible example of such new physics is supersymmetry, and I'll come back to that later in the talk. So, so let me illustrate again the problem. So here is the uh, familiar part of the Mexican hat, and here's the brim, and here is how it's turned down by the top quark. So there have been many calculations of this uh, over the years. We did a calculation back in, I think it was 2009. More recently, the calculations have been refined in detail. Uh, this is, I think, uh, the latest one. So what's shown here on the horizontal axis is the mass of the Higgs. The vertical axis is the mass of the top. So in this region down here, the potential would be stable. Up here, it will be very unstable. It's actually in a region where it's unstable, but with a lifetime longer than the age of the universe so far, which is just as well, because if it was less than the age of the universe so far, we wouldn't understand why we're here. So this is like a one and two single excursion in that calculation. So you, I like to underline that this stability calculation is sensitive to the mass of the Higgs, which we now know, the mass of the top, which has also been measured, but also to the value of the strong coupling. And uh, in fact, if you look at a parametric representation of the uncertainties of this calculation, uh, this uncertainty coming from the strong coupling is perhaps becoming one of the dominant ones. 
Anyway, you put in the measured numbers, and that's what you get. That potential becomes unstable at a scale of around 10 to the 11 GB. So besides the vacuum where we are living today, there is another state with lower energy, and eventually, according to quantum mechanics, we are doomed to fall into that lower state. And our vacuum, empty space, is unstable. As I said, I don't believe that. I believe there has to be some new physics to stabilize the vacuum, and we'll come back to that later. Okay, so that was the mass of the Higgs. Now, uh, many couplings of the Higgs boson have also been measured. So, of course, in the standard model, as we saw a few slides back, the coupling of the Higgs to other particles are proportional to their masses. And uh, this plot here shows you how, as a function of the Higgs mass, uh, various different decay modes take over if the Higgs is sufficiently heavy to produce them. So, for example, just saying, if it weighed 750 GV, then we'd be out here somewhere, and the dominant decays would be to W pairs, Z pairs, and top quarks. However, we're not at 750 GV, we're at 125 GV, and again, we're lucky because many decay modes of the Higgs boson are measurable. Now, I'd just like to point to one curiosity, which is that the most important process for producing the Higgs, glue glue and the Higgs, and one of the most distinctive decay modes, which is the gamma gamma, are actually both generated by quantum loop diagrams. So here is the loop diagram responsible for loop loop fusion. And a similar loop diagram is responsible for Higgs and a gamma gamma. So this means that right from the get-go, right from July to the 4th, 2012, we were already sensitive to quantum effects in the properties of the Higgs boson, which had already started giving us constraints on possible new physics. Again, I'd like to emphasize that we are, in some sense, exceedingly lucky that the mass is around 125 GV because we can do all this reason rich physics. Okay, so what do we expect in more detail? So uh, here is a sort of a pizza which shows you the uh, branching ratios of the Higgs boson. So uh, Higgs into gamma gamma is actually very rare, it's distinctive, but very rare. Higgs into ZZ star, that's also pretty rare. Uh, Higgs into tau tau over here. The dominant decay mode is actually expected to be Higgs into BB bar. And in fact, despite the great efforts of the experimental collaboration so far, there's still not real five sigma discovery evidence for that dominant Higgs decay mode. So this is uh, taken from uh, a combined paper by Atlas and CMS, uh, in which they review uh, various different production modes for the Higgs boson, various different decay modes for the Higgs boson. You can see many properties have been measured in quite some uh, detail, uh, but there are open questions. I've already mentioned uh, Higgs into BB bar. Uh, another thing we'd like to see is Higgs into 2 mu. In the standard model, that decay should be very suppressed because the mu mass is very small compared to, say, the tau mass. And so far, experiments just have uh, upper limits on it. We'd also like to see directly the coupling of the Higgs to the top quark. Top quark, of course, being the heaviest known fermion. It's expected to have a big coupling, but it's very difficult to produce the Higgs in association with TT bar, although the experiments are now closing in on that also. So a few years ago, with my uh, then PhD student, uh, Thibault Yu, uh, we did a simple little exercise. We said, OK, the prediction is that the couplings of the Higgs boson should be proportional to other particle masses. Let's test that by choosing a parameterization where the couplings are proportional to the masses, but to some different power, let's call it 1 plus epsilon. And we did a global fit to the data that were available then. So the standard model proportional to mass, that's the red line. And you can see the data were completely consistent with it. And uh, in fact, our best fit is shown by the standard line here. So uh, we wrote in our paper that this particle walks and quacks like a Higgs boson, and uh, Peter Higgs can start smiling. 
Well, subsequently, that type of analysis has been done much better, much more professionally, with more data jointly by Atlas and CMS, and here's their result. And you can see that, again, the data are extremely consistent with this linear dependence of the couplings on the particle mass. <coughs> so, uh, as you know, in 2013, uh, François Anglais and Peter Higgs got the Nobel Prize. And in citation for the Nobel Prize, uh, the Nobel Prize Committee wrote, we now believe that beyond any reasonable doubt, it is the Higgs boson. So to and I would be proud, because that quotation was taken from our paper. But what the Nobel Prize Committee did not know was that it was in the preprint version of our paper, but not in the published journal version of the paper, because the referee said that beyond any reasonable doubt is not a scientific statement. <laughs> so to get our paper published, we have to take that out. Uh, so it's not good enough for the journal, but it's good enough for the Nobel Prize. <laughs> okay. So, 2012, particle is discovered. Looks very much like a Higgs boson. So now we come to the key question, is there life after this? And so now I take as my reference point, James Bond, <laughs> with maybe a couple of modifications. <laughs> uh, also I modify the title of his movie, and I argue that the standard model is not enough. <laughs> and uh, in deference to James Bond, I give 007 reasons for saying that. So one of them I've already given you, and that is the fact that within the standard model, you calculate, it looks like, our empty space is unstable. I already mentioned dark matter. Astronomers and astrophysicists tell us that there is way more dark matter in the universe than visible matter. Is that some sort of particle that maybe we can discover at the NC? There's a problem of the origin of Donald Trump. What created the matter-antimatter symmetry that made it possible for that man to exist? <laughs> Is that related to some sort of fundamental particle properties? <laughs> neutrinos. A lot of you are interested in neutrinos. There's many interesting problems to do with the masses and mixing of neutrinos. There's a problem of what's often called the hierarchy problem, the tremendous ratio of, of different scales that we have in physics from the Planck scale of gravity down to the electron weak scale. Cosmological inflation, an idea for why the universe is so big and old. Again, something that cannot be explained within the standard model. And of course, quantum gravity. So, 007 reasons for thinking there must be physics beyond the standard model. Many of these are going to be studied in some way or other in round two of the early C. And I would argue that many of those problems are, if not solved, at least mitigated uh, if you have supersymmetry or symmetry, <coughs> which is still my favorite candidate for possible physics beyond the standard model and accessible. <coughs> so it should be said that, uh, of course, that's very much a, a personal point of view. And uh, this problem of the hierarchy of different mass scales different theorists react to it in, in many different ways. So this is a slide that I stole from a presentation by Nathaniel Craig a few years ago. You know, some people don't worry about the hierarchy of mass scales. Other people say, well, it's just fine-tuned. Uh, maybe it has to be fine-tuned in order for us to exist. Personally, I'm one of these people who believes that the hierarchy of mass scales <coughs> to invoke some sort of new physics to stabilize it and as I already mentioned, my favorite candidate for that is symmetry. So, so the ways I, way I would describe it is uh, a little bit in uh, terms of a cartoon that appeared during the First World War. So uh, you have to imagine you're a couple of Susie theorists and you're in the trenches and the enemy is attacking and everyone is criticizing supersymmetry and saying it's a load of scrap. But one supersymmetry theorist says to the other supersymmetry theorist, if you know of a better theory, go to it. No. Okay, so we'll stick with supersymmetry. 
Okay. Now, I, I should say that uh, there are different points of view on, uh, on this hierarchy problem, as I already mentioned. <coughs> so on the left of this slide here, we see a point of view which says, well, you know, maybe the Higgs is effectively elementary. Uh, but then, in that case, you have problems when you calculate new diagrams, which tend to destabilize the hierarchy of mass scales. And then the natural thing to do is to postulate supersymmetry, which has the effect of removing uh, the worst divergences in those quantum loops. So that's one of the motivations for supersymmetry. So that's the theory on the left of the slide. And then there's the alt-right theory. The alt-right theory is that the Higgs is composite, made up out of fermion and fermion pairs, like the pion and QCD, for example, with single conductivity, uh, constituents held together by some new force. So, so people have been working on such theories for many, many years, and uh, it's actually been quite difficult uh, to make one which is compatible with the available data. But this, I think, is still very much a, a live idea, uh, with the Higgs nowadays interpreted as being some sort of pseudo Nambu Goldstone boson associated with some partially broken high order symmetry. Okay, so this possibility uh, has been explored quite a lot in, in uh, recent years. Uh, typically, what people do is they write down uh, an effective Lagrangian which resembles the standard model, but with some of the couplings treated as three parameters. So those are the ones written in red here, A, B, C, D, and so on. Those are parameters which have the value one in the standard model, but you know, the standard model may not be right. There may be deviations from one, and you can interrogate the data to ask you know, what constraints are there on those parameters, and is there any indication that they might be different from one corresponding to new physics. So this is uh, one such plot which was done by the uh, G-fitter group. So what you see in uh, yellow and orange here, these are actually the measurements of the Higgs boson, which are compatible with those modified couplings actually not being modified, just being one. Uh, the experimentalists choose different names for them, but these are the same parameters that I had on the previous slide. So the orange ones, those are the uh, Higgs measurements. But you can also combine them with measurements of precision <coughs> data, the sort of thing that was done at LEP in the 1990s. And that combination gives you the, the blue ellipse, which is much more constraining uh, than the Higgs data alone. And this is a joint analysis of uh, Atlas and uh, CMS data, which uh, again is consistent with the standard model prediction of, of one here. And you can compare that with uh, typical uh, composite models. Uh, so here is a couple of composite models here with some parameter which describes the deviation from the standard model. And as you can see, the data are consistent with the standard model, and they tell you that you better adjust this composite parameter so that's to be less than about 0.1 or 0.2. So if you like, if you like composite models, you can continue to believe in them, but you're beginning to have to start adjusting the parameters so as to be compatible with the data. So another possibility is to say, okay, maybe the couplings of the Higgs boson are exactly what was written in the standard model on slide two. But maybe in addition to those couplings, there are additional couplings in the effective Lagrangian, couplings of higher operator dimension. So uh, then what you do is, for example, you look at possible corrections to the standard model for dimension six. You look at effective interactions, which are scaled inversely by some scale lambda, presumably some large scale representing in physics, lambda squared. And these dimension six operators here, which are called here ON, are made up out of standard model fields with precisely the standard model gauge company. Okay, so standard model particles, just as written on the t-shirt, but with additional interactions besides. So this can get a little bit complicated. 
uh, you sort of shrug your shoulders a little bit there. It gets a lot more complicated than this. This is the simple version, right? And if you actually write out the thing for generality, I think it's 2,499 dimension 6 operators, so uh, you have to be a little bit crazy to, to do that. But don't worry, because if you're just interested in analyzing the data on the Higgs boson and the precision electroweak data that I mentioned, and also it's important to look at triple gauge couplings, if we just look at that restricted set of data, then there's a restricted set of operators that come in. So here is a result that uh, a global analysis that uh, we did, uh, including a number of Valencia, sounds. Uh, so we did a, a global fit within this uh, effective uh, field theory approach, and uh, as you can see, there's a relatively small number of operators which are important, at least at the level of the analysis that we did then. And uh, we looked at the constraints on these operator coefficients coming from Higgs production, from uh, measurements of triple gauge couplings, so we put the whole thing together, uh, we did a global combination, and we also did an analysis where we just switched on one operator at a time. So what you can see from this is that uh, the data uh, analyzed here are already telling you that this new physics scale, lambda, has to be somewhere around a TV. It might be a little bit smaller than one TV, but, but it's not 200 GB. Okay. So this was done with uh, LHC11 data, and uh, we're currently redoing this analysis using all the available one <coughs> two data, uh, and that paper will be coming up shortly. I would like to emphasize the uh, complementarity of measurements oops, sorry, uh, involving Higgs production and triple gauge couplings. And uh, let me just, I will show you this slide uh, by Adam Tarkovsky and collaborators. So here in green, we've got the constraints coming from Higgs measurements of a particular combination of parameters. Here we've got in orange, constraints coming from measurements of triple gauge couplings. And blue here is the other one. So what you see is that Higgs measurements triple gauge coupling measurements uh, complement each other in a very nice way and one needs to do a, a global analysis of all these electroweak observables in order to get the best possible constraints on new physics beyond the standard model. Okay, so precise measurements of the Higgs boson are a way to look for physics beyond the standard model, but what is that physics beyond the standard model? So, I've already revealed my prejudice. Uh, I confess that I am in a long-term monogamous relationship with Susie. <laughs> I have loved Susie since about 1980. And uh, despite you know, the many experimental disappointments, I remain faithful. In fact, over the years, I've discovered even more reasons for still loving supersymmetry. So as I already mentioned, supersymmetry can stabilize the electroweak vacuum. It actually made a successful prediction for the mass of the Higgs boson. It predicted that it would weigh about 125. <coughs> it also predicted correctly that the couplings would resemble those in the standard model. So I would argue that LHC11 has given us three additional reasons for loving Susie. And that's in addition to all the old traditional reasons like uh, the naturalness of the gauge hierarchy, Grandi defined theories, uh, string theory, and of course, uh, dark matter, I'll come back to in a moment. So, for the benefit of the students in the audience, supersymmetry is a unique hypothetical symmetry that would link together particles of matter and force particles. Because what it does is it relates particles that spin at different rates. And uh, being a, uh, an artistic turn of mind, I like to compare elementary particles to ballet dancers that pirouette at different speeds. 
So, for example, the electron has a spin one half. It pirouettes slowly. The photon has spin one. It pirouettes more rapidly. And the beauty of supersymmetry is that it can relate these particles that spin at different rates. Okay, so that, that's one reason for liking it, but there are practical reasons as well. Uh, as I just mentioned, it could help stabilize a hierarchy of masses. It could help unify the fundamental forces. It predicted a relatively light Higgs boson. And it provides a dark matter uh, that the astrophysicists and the cosmologists tell us to expect, which I'm returning to in a moment. So, so when supersymmetry was uh, originally studied, people hoped that it might be possible to relate directly, say, the electron with the photon. It turns out not to be possible. <coughs> Instead, what you have to do is you have to postulate that all the standard model particles uh, shown here have supersymmetric partners, shown over here with little twiddles on top, which have the same internal quantum numbers, like the same electric charge, for example, but they, as I said, spin at different rates. So, from an experimental point of view, this is a uh, potential bonanza, because it gives you an enormous number of new supersymmetric particles, particles to look for at PLAC. Now, looking for these supersymmetric particles uh, is complicated. It's complicated because there are many different versions of supersymmetry. So this is another slide that I stole from Nathaniel Cray. And uh, here he's got a sort of diagram of uh, all the different variants of a supersymmetric theory that the theorists have come up with. There's uh, hidden versions, there's stealthy versions, uh, there's unnatural versions, there's natural versions, there's split versions. Many different variants of supersymmetry which make different predictions for the shape of the spectrum, for example, how compressed the spectrum might be, and if the spectrum is very compressed, for example, that complicates the experimental searches. So it would be nice if somebody could tell us which of these supersymmetric variants is the right one. But nobody knows, and uh, as I like to say, there are no signposts in superspace. So the experimentalists have been doing a fantastic job looking for different possible manifestations of supersymmetric particles. <coughs> and they have found nothing. No supersymmetry yet. But nothing else either. Yes. Now, now personally, you know, if I was somebody who liked composite models, I would be more concerned than as I am as a supersymmetrist. Because I would have expected composite models to have shown up by now. I think they're more difficult to hide than supersymmetry is. Nevertheless, I mean, people often ask me whether I'm discouraged or depressed or desperate, disconsolate. I'm disappointed so far, but, but not depressed. But nevertheless, but the absence so far of any discovery of physically understanding one of the NEC, you know, makes us ask, you know, how should we continue this search? Should we just continue doing it? in the same old way, or maybe there's some corner of parameter space that we somehow overlooked or didn't study properly, or uh, maybe there's some sort of novel signature that we should be looking for. So I think that's very much you know, the name of the game in LHC Part 2, is you know, being a bit more creative in terms of what we're looking for. <coughs> so, so one of my activities is uh, a member of the Master Code Collaboration, which is a group of uh, theorists and experimentalists. Uh, and what we do is we analyze all the available data uh, in the context of different supersymmetric models. So this uh, table, taken from a recent paper of ours, gives you some flavor of the 
pun intended, of which data you actually analyze. Actually, this is not a complete list. This is just an update last year, since the previous year, of new data relevant to supersymmetry. The full thing goes down there somewhere. So there's uh, precision electroweak observables. There's uh, flavor observables. Uh, for example, somewhere in here is uh, BS goes to view view, which is uh, recently got measured with uh, quite high accuracy by the LC collaboration, the LCB. There's dark matter observables, which include the dark matter density, but also upper limits on the uh, dark matter scattering rate. And then, of course, there's LHC observables. That's where there's been you know, a big advance uh, with, in particular, uh, the first round of data from LHC run 2, which we incorporate in our analysis. So I should mention uh, two anomalies which might indicate possible physics beyond the standard model. So one is the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. This could very comfortably be explained by supersymmetry at the scale of a few hundred GeV. But as we'll see, there's some tension between that explanation and the LHC constraints on supersymmetry. Um, a little open parenthesis, you may have heard a couple of weeks ago that there was a series of papers arguing that you could maybe explain the G minus 2 discrepancy through gravitational effects. You know, a lot of people have looked at this and the conclusion is no. But, so, at least maybe you modify gravity, but that's not as well. So that's one anomaly which is still there and uh, we're looking forward perhaps later on this year to uh, a new round of data from the experiment at Fermilab which uh, may provide more precision, or should provide more precision on the experimental value. <coughs> the other anomaly which I should mention is uh, anomalies in uh, K in B decays. Uh, in particular, I highlight B decay, K star decays. It's very difficult for me to explain those anomalies in the framework of the sort of supersymmetric theory that I've been studying. <coughs> If those turn out to be confirmed, I think those would be indicative of some new physics which is not supersymmetry. Whereas the mu minus 2 anomaly might be indicative of supersymmetry. Okay, so uh, here is a fit that we did uh, at the end of last year uh, to a purely phenomenological supersymmetric model with no or very few a priori assumptions what, what the supersymmetric spectrum might look like. And uh, this fit uh, includes G minus 2 as a constraint. We've also done a fit in which we forget about G minus 2 and say, well, well, maybe there's some problem in the interpretation of the experimental theory, and uh, maybe we shouldn't take G minus 2 seriously. But on this slide, we take G minus 2 seriously. So there's a couple of features that I'd like to draw your attention to. <coughs> This is the best fit spectrum. What you see is that uh, a number of these supersymmetric particles are potentially accessible to the LAC. Others, no, but some <coughs> potentially yes. And what I would also point out is that some of the electroweak particles have relatively low masses below 500 GV, and so they would be accessible to, for example, a linear collider with a center of mass energy of 1 TeV. 250 GeV, not enough. 500 GeV, probably not enough either, but 1 TeV maybe. So here I actually show you the likelihood function for the mass of the lightest supersymmetric particle. The lightest supersymmetric particle is the one that, according to this theory, could be the dark matter. And uh, so we've got fits here uh, with G minus 2, and drop of G minus 2. And uh, what you see is this fit with G minus 2 as a preferred value for the LSP mass, which is around 250, 300 GV or so. Uh, on the other hand, you also see that if you dropped G minus 2 as a constraint, then the preferred mass would be around 1 TV. So you know, we supersymmetry theorists are very keen 
to have this G minus two anomaly clarified one way or the other. Okay, so so far I have been uh, talking pretty much exclusively uh, about the LHC. But the cycle on to the subject of dark matter, let me now just mention briefly the current status of searches, direct searches uh, for dark matter. So this is a well-known plot that was first prepared for the snow mass uh, meeting a few years ago. And what it shows you is, as a function of the mass of some dark matter particle, it could be supersymmetry, it could be some more gen generic, weakly attracting massive particle along the horizontal axis. As a function of that mass, up here you've got the cross section, and these lines correspond to various <coughs> actual and prospective constraints on the scattering cross section of that dark matter particle. So uh, these solid lines up here, these correspond to uh, published limits. Since it's properly done, there have been some improvements in these limits, which I'll come back to on the next slide. The dashed lines here, these correspond to prospective sensitivities of experiments that are either now under construction or are planned. This orange dashed line down the bottom here that is the level at which you start getting a very large background from astrophysical neutrinos. So at low energies, there will be neutrinos from the sun. At higher energies, neutrinos produced by cosmic rays hitting the atmosphere. So there is an experimental uh, roadmap for getting down very close to this uh, so-called neutrino floor. If the experiments <coughs> 10 years time, don't see anything about the neutrino floor, then it's not so obvious how one could continue that direct search for dark matter scattering. But for 10 years, I think there is a way forward. This pink region here, this is the region which uh, is favored in supersymmetric models. So uh, this pink blob was uh, drawn a few years ago uh, I will show you some updated versions of that law uh, based on more detailed studies on the next slide. But what you can see generically is that there is a region of supersymmetric model space where these upcoming experiments have a good chance of seeing something. But equally, there's also the possibility the cross section might be below that neutrino floor. So, that plot was for searches for direct, direct searches for dark matter scattering via spin independent scattering. And uh, this is an updated plot where now we've got uh, the latest experimental results. Uh, in fact, in the region of interest, the uh, most stringent upper limit on the dark matter scattering cross section comes from the Panda X experiment. Uh, here's the neutrino floor, here's our prediction. Uh, don't worry so much about these different colors, that's a more detailed discussion. We could have that later if you're interested. But again, typically you see that in this model, the cross section might be large enough to be detected soon, or it may take a while longer, or it might be below the neutrino floor. Now that was supposed to be an independent scattering. Now, there's also spin-dependent scattering. And uh, this is something that has been looked for in particular by the, uh, the PICO experiment. And it's something that you can also look for indirectly because spin-independence, sorry, spin-dependent scattering uh, is important for the capture of dark matter particles by the sun. And once they're captured inside the sun, they can annihilate there and give you neutrinos. And so uh, these lines up here correspond to the constraints coming from the solar neutrinos in various different interpretations. Uh, this here is the region of scattering cross section, spin dependent scattering that we find in our model. And this is the, again the analog of the neutrino floor that we saw on the left hand side. Okay, similar picture. The spin dependent scattering could be close. The current experimental limit, 
in my mind. So, when the uh, Higgs boson was discovered in 2012, uh, it uh, got a lot of attention in some places that you might not expect, including the uh, Economist magazine. Uh, Economics is known in English as the dismal science, uh, but this was a, a great piece of science. They had this historical review of how long it took for new particles to be postulated and subsequently discovered. And of course, uh, the record so far is held by the Higgs boson because it took 48 years from postulation to discovery, uh, during which Peter Higgs evolved. Uh, actually, I'm cheating somewhat because this is not actually a picture when he was doing the Higgs boson work. This is actually his passport photo when he was a student. Let's go again. Anyway, so 48 years to wait for the Higgs boson. Uh, so, lovers of physics beyond the standard model, lovers of supersymmetry, just be patient. Sometimes it takes a while. And I like to take my supersymmetric friends. Uh, supersymmetry was postulated at the end of 1973. So, so far, it's only 44 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, what of the future? Well, the LHC will continue to operate. Uh, so this is the, uh, the one plan, uh, which extends for perhaps another 20 years, gathering perhaps 100 times more data than what have been analyzed so far. So we're currently in uh, one two, which uh, continues until the end of this year. By that time, maybe we'll have a bit over 100 inverse center ones. And eventually, we hope to get 2,000 inverse center ones. So there's a lot more LHC data to come, and still prospects for discovering new physics. But of course, people are thinking about other ideas. So one of the ideas that's been studied actively at CERN, also in China, is the idea of a large future circular collider. And uh, this is an image showing what this large future circular collider might look, might look like in the neighborhood of Geneva, Actually, Geneva is sort of sitting there inside the collider. Um, so if that comes about, the LHC will be renamed. It will no longer be the Large Hadron Collider, it will be the Little Hadron Collider. <laughs> this thing will be in a tunnel uh, 100 meters in circumference, which will enable us to make proton-proton collisions at 100 TV, and or to do very precise that is at low energies and you minus annihilation, uh, which would enable us to probe the 10 TV scale indirectly. So th this plot actually compares what you could do with those low energy E plus E minus collisions, <coughs> compares it with other E plus E minus collider possibilities, uh, for example, <coughs> which has a lower luminosity but goes to higher energies, and here is the ILC, which is possible upgrade. So such a machine would enable us to uh, study the Higgs with a fantastic precision. So this is you know, a future version of that plot that I showed you a couple of times previously. That's an E plus E minus collision. Of course, proton-proton collisions, you will produce a very large number of Higgs bosons, orders of magnitude more than what has been produced with the LHC. And for the first time, you would also get you know, a real possibility of measuring the triple Higgs coupling, that self-coupling lambda that I mentioned a few slides back. And of course, with 100 TV proton-proton collisions, you could discover new particles that are weighing 10 TV or more. And so studies have shown that you can, for example, discover uh, sparks and arenas at about 10 TV. Okay, so that brings me to the end of what I was planning to say. So, the discovery of the Higgs boson of the LHC, fantastic success for experimental physics, fantastic success for theoretical physics, but also a fantastic challenge for us theorists to try to understand better this particle and the physics that might lie beyond it. So since the LHC 
are continuing to run. With many more collisions in the coming years, it's quite possible that the LHC will discover new physics beyond the standard model. Perhaps that's one, two, one, three, one, four, or whatever. I, I personally believe that if the LHC does discover new physics beyond the standard model, then the top priority for the community will be to study that. But if it does not discover directly new physics, then the priority will presumably be to focus on the Higgs boson and measure its properties in more detail in the hope of uncovering some indirect evidence for possible new physics. So this is where I just lose a lot of friends, because in my view, a large circular collider gives you the best combination of prospects for the future. You can either do high energy proton proton, or you can do E plus E minus with extremely high luminosity, and either way, we can explore the 10 TV range. What we will discover there, I don't know. So that is my answer to the question. <laughs> So, the, the studies so far by uh, the Atlas and CMS collaborations indicate that with the LHC, even with 3,000 inverse femtobars, your measurement of the triple Higgs coupling, if you're lucky, might only be at the level of 30% or so. You're not going to get a precise measurement. Uh, so, people have thought about how you might look for it in the e plus e minus machine or in a higher energy proton proton machine. Click, okay, 3 TV central mass has a real prospect of measuring the triple X coupling. A uh, future circular proton machine could give you a good measurement of the self coupling of the X. But LEC, I don't think, is going to give you a good measurement. <coughs> but I completely agree with what you say that, yes, it is a X boson, but not necessarily, not necessarily the X boson. Of course, in supersymmetry, for example, you have a lot four other Higgs bosons to be discovered. But um, so far, the experimenters haven't found any of this Thank you. Further questions? You mentioned the circular collider. What about the Future linear colliders. Why? Why the circular is more advantageous than, than the linear ones? I'm not talking about financial or wherever they are built, but from the scientific point of view. So, so this is the plot that I, that I showed. Okay, so this compares the various different uh, the e plus e minus projects which are being discussed at the moment. So, uh, so this is click here, goes up to 3 TV in the center of mass. Uh, this is the ILC, which, which is now being proposed for 250, with a potential upgrade to perhaps eventually 1 TV, and with also a possibility of a luminosity upgrade. So this here is what you could do in a 100, circular, 100 kilometer circular tunnel with electron positive conditions. And the energy is limited, and at the limit of the energy, the luminosity is comparable with the linear colliders. But at low energies, you get much more luminosity, just the way these machines work. Okay. So if 
you know, in a few years' time, it turns out that there really is a premium on precision, low energy measurements. That would be a very uh, interesting option. Now, you could imagine that uh, you would do something similar to what was done in the 27 kilometer tunnel with first of all them and then the LHC. So that's why I said the circular tunnel offers you all sorts of uh, options. On to this. Yeah, just uh, following this uh, this comment, I think that this plot does not show the whole story, in the sense that uh, you sh maybe you should also include in your argumentation polarization. I mean, what in the, between the two different uh, options of the machines? Can you comment on that? Yeah. So, the circular collider would have polarization up to the uh, WW threshold. And uh, that's actually important, for example, for being able to uh, measure the, uh, the energy very precisely. And if you want to do you know, incredibly high precision uh, Z physics, that's absolutely crucial. But it would not have polarization at the higher yeah. But in the you would have polarization. Well, I, I, I know that's so in some sense the baseline option, although I see discussion about how important that is and, and how likely that would be to be realized in the first uh, implementation. In principle, in the construction uh, project, I mean, polarization is a key issue. Right. Andrea. <clears throat> uh, if, let me focus on supersymmetry. So it's clear uh, how the LHC can improve our uh, understanding of uh, the parameter space of supersymmetry. And also you show how dark matter measurements can also have an impact on uh, understanding uh, the supersymmetric version of the beyond the standard model physics. I would like to understand if uh, the ongoing program on neutrino physics uh, uh, could also give some hint, uh, if you believe that supersymmetry is the answer, could give some hint on how this supersymmetry model should be. For example, uh, searches about uh, CP violation in neutrinos, searches about uh, neutrino less double beta decay, or non-standard interaction in neutrinos. Thanks. Yeah. Well, clearly those experiments in uh, neutrino physics are of key importance. And uh, if I come back to my one of my questions about the origin of Donald Trump, then I think you know, the best avenue for solving that problem uh, may well be neutrino physics, and in particular the measurements that you mentioned, the CP violation in neutrino is double piece of game. Although, um, they only give you, uh, they give you indirect you know, confirmation of, of the ideas that go into ideas for generating the, uh, the matter of symmetry, but they would probably not be able to do numerical calculations. <coughs> The actual calculation would depend on other parameters that would not be measured in that way. But that's not uh, as a side of mine. So uh, I, see, I must confess that I see neutrino physics and supersymmetry as being somehow orthogonal directions in physics beyond the standard model. And, and that's why I did not succeed in saying very much about neutrino physics in my, uh, in my talk. But there is one very interesting, I think, synergy between the two. So if indeed there is supersymmetry, and if indeed neutrino physics pans out the way that we expect, then you can ask yourself what happens when you combine supersymmetry with neutrino physics. And what you would get is charge lepton flavor violation. And we get charge lepton flavor violation at a level where it might conceivably reasonably be explored in uh, accelerator experiments. And, and that combination of supersymmetry and CP violation that gives you access to additional observables in the neutrino sector, which might bear more directly on the origin of Donald Trump. A question from the other side of the room, maybe? If there isn't any, I want to come back to this. Um, the top mass, the Higgs mass, and vacuum stability. You, you calculate 
the scale at which some new physics has to come in to save the universe. Um, how, how rigorous can that argument be made? Can we really make that a quantitative argument and then as we improve Higgs mass, top mass, our fast measurements, to what kind of scales could we lower the upper limit on, on the scale where new physics has to enter? So, so within the standard, within the standard model, you can calculate the, uh, the evolution of the coupling up to high energies basically as accurately as you want. Okay, and people have now done calculations with speed of burning and so on and so forth. So, of course, refinements in the calculation are possible, and uh, so this particular one that I show here did this slightly from this one that I show down here. But I think that's not important at the present stage. So, so what this formula tells you is the parametric dependence of the scale at which this goes negative, parametric dependence on n higgs, n top, and r x. So actually now m higgs is well enough known that this is not the limiting parameter. If it had been under 26 GV, the picture would have been quite different. If it had been 130 GV, it would be very different. Right? Now we know it's 125 plus or minus you know, maximum 0.2. Uh, this uncertainty is relatively small. So as many of you know, the uncertainty in, in M top is, is a big issue. And uh, it's a big issue experimentally, it's a big issue uh, theoretically. So experimentally, uh, it, it, it's not so simple. Well, I should be a little bit careful. Fractionally, the uncertainty in M top is incredibly small. Okay. But in terms of GV, it's still somewhere between 0.5 and 1 GV. Okay. And uh, there's some uncertainties in what is the interpretation of the Monte Carlo mass that people use when they're doing the measurement. Uh, there are issues to do with the theoretical interpretation. Uh, if you want to relate it to some fundamental parameter of Lagrangian, you need some QCD corrections. And discussion about uncertainties in those. So, I quote here a number which is very aggressive. That I just got by combining naively the latest experimental determinations. Okay. Um, you could load that up by a factor of two. It's not going to change the picture substantially. As I mentioned, alpha s, so that's the parametric dependence over here. So that used to be not so important. But in fact, the particle data group in the most recent global analysis actually increased the uncertainty in alpha s. Um, and I refer you to their review for, for why it is that they did that. Uh, but formally, this is actually now actually slightly larger error than that. So we need to push on those two fronts, m top and alpha s. There are no hidden uncertainties. As soon as we get those two parameters to affect the 10 better precision, we will know this well, scale. If you do a factor of 10 better, then the theory is going to have to work a lot harder. Right? <laughs> but, if you but, do a, but if you do a factor of 2 better, no, that's already, I think, uh, that's something the theory is already able to handle. Okay. One last question to. Um. So, if you want, uh, yes, I see it's, it's difficult to to say many precise things. But uh, if you had to bet, uh, what what could you be the the bet of the, the what is the your bet for the the probability of finding new physics, say, in Brantu or in in the in, in the large uh, circular collider, I, I mean, one percent to find new physics, ten percent, ten to minus five. <laughs> ten to minus. Well, uh, I, I, I'm not really a, a betting person. <laughs> uh, so run two, well, you know, already, you know, a significant fraction of the data has been analysed. And uh, no published indication of new physics. Every once in a while, one hears a rumor, but tend to go away again. Uh, 
I heard another rumor last week, but uh, you know, I'm not holding my breath. Uh, you know, future runs of the LHC, as I said, that's a different ballgame, because then you're talking about uh, you know, 30 times more data that are going to be accumulated uh, during, during run two. Uh, so as I said, I, I'm not a betting person, uh, but people often say that the, 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 the best way to uh, figure betting odds is just what people do rather than what they say they're prepared to do. You understand what I'm saying? So I, I think that to ask me what I would bet is not the same thing as asking me what I actually do. So, so you just look at my publications. What do I work on? So I work on supersymmetry, I work on dark matter, I work on uh, Higgs bosons, and I work on future colliders. Okay. And uh, so the fact that I spend my time working on that Time is the most valuable thing that we have. Right. Excellent. Let's stop here. Thanks very much.